All right, so I think uh, we're about ready to start. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Tan Zanu from uh, NSPO. Uh, Dr. Tan is heading the 6U uh, Remote Sensing CubeSat project currently uh, uh, in development, and uh, uh, we're happy that he can come here and share with us uh, some information regarding the development of this mission, particular challenges faced, and uh, the solutions that they're implementing. So, uh, Dr. Tan? So, hi. Uh Thank you, Lauren, for the invitation. I mean, uh, for the uh, the invitation from TSU. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me try to pull up my slides. I'm Chen Yu. Uh, I'm on behalf of the NSPO 6 team. I'd like to present my work today, or our work today, uh, is the 6 Pathfinder CubeSat project uh, for NSPO's future mission. So a little bit about NSPO. I believe that uh, a lot of our previous speaker have spoke about NSPO, but still I have to introduce a little bit. So uh, NSPO is the National Institute for Space Engineering Development. So uh, we've been working on satellite development since 1990 or 1989, I think. Yeah, and uh, it has been three phases of uh, space development since 1989. Uh, the first phase is for capacity, capacity building. So it's more related to how to, uh, for, for Taiwan to learn how to operate a satellite. For the second phase is how to manufacture a satellite. And for the third phase, we have more mission of our own. Uh, we have remote sensing satellite mission. We also have uh, other missions that's related to uh, communications. So, uh, so far in Taiwan, uh, so for NSBO, we developed one CubeSat before, it's called YAMSET. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have a launch opportunity during that time. And we sponsor several CubeSat mission in Taiwan, uh, one including uh, the idea sets from Professor Chen, uh, Lauren, and also we have NotSet from National Formosa University, and also USET that is sponsoring a joint uh, development group, I believe from National Taiwan Ocean University and some uh, private companies. So, so we we do have little. A, a little bit experience on CubeSats, but uh, not as concentrated. Uh, we, we didn't actually concentrate our focus on the CubeSat project until now. So, so uh, today I will be presenting a little, a little bit about our ongoing 6U uh, CubeSat projects. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the project manager. My name is Chen Yu. Uh, I have 10 years experience in robotics since I was a graduate student. Uh, one year of experience in autonomous driving. So you can see I am actually not a space engineer. I used to be working on the ground better. So, and uh, after the, that 11 years of experience, I joined MSBO in January 2019, and I joined the Flight Control Division. So the Flight Control Division in MSBO, we focus more on AOCS, of AOCS subsystems. Uh, which is like uh, the pointing of a satellite, so which is pretty related to remote sensing satellites. And I was uh, in charge of the uh, outdoor landing GNC, uh, which is uh, more advanced uh, robotics related uh, techniques that we want to integrate that into our newer satellites. So uh, I was working on that, did um, for MOSAT 8, and now I became the project manager since October of 2019. So it's been a year and a half. So I'm not having too much experience on space engineering. If you think there is something that I talked today is incorrect, then you are probably correct. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so that's all of the uh, introduction and that's come to the outline of today. So today I will talk about our mission, uh, the objective of our mission and some main trade-off of the mission itself. And I will talk about the current development progress. So a little bit about the bus, the payload and INT. And I will be open to discussion after uh, the first two parts. Okay, so the objective of this 6U CubeSats is uh, to validate the key technology for our future uh, mission. Uh, it's actually for MOSAT 9, but um, 
I was told not to mention this name yet. So <laughs> I have to blur FS9 a little bit in the slide. Uh, so the very first uh, key technology to be validated is the TDI CMOS sensor that was um, designed and manufactured in Taiwan. So it's actually designed by the TSRI, Taiwan Semiconductor Research Institute, and the manufacturing is in TSMC. And uh, we built this TDI CMOS sensor for our future mission, and we want to validate, uh, or we want to at least measure the performance and uh, get you uh, get uh, um, get familiar with how to operate the TDI sensor in this mission in, in this six U mission. Uh, the second thing is to raise the TRL of Korsh type telescope manufacturing. So the Korsh type telescope is a different kind of telescope uh, from for MOSAT eight. Um, our uh, previous remote sensing missions are uh, another type of telescope. And for, for, for MOSAT 9, we are uh, using Korsh type telescope and we want to raise the TRL of this type of telescope. Uh, I, will dis I will talk a little bit more about this type of telescope later uh, in, in, in the slides afterward. Okay. The third thing to validate is the onboard compression functionality. And we are using JPEG 2000 uh, image compression. And we want to make sure that this onboard compression capability could be used in future mission. So that's the three key technology that we want to implement and we want to validate in this mission. So there are some other value added mission um, uh, together with the main focus. Uh, one is super resolution feasibility. Uh, we uh, so we do carry uh, some computing core that has AI capability. So uh, with AI means artificial intelligence. So uh, we we are trying some super resolution feasibility and also AI detection feasibility and also some night capturing image for this satellite. But we define it as value added mission, not the key feature of the mission. And so we are aiming for operational validation, not a full scale image mission. So uh, there's a lot of trade-offs that uh, based on our previous experience on for MOSAT, uh, on for MOSAT 5 and for MOSAT 8, they are what well, those larger missions are for scale uh, image mission. But for our CubeSat mission, we are only aiming for operational uh, validation. And the second goal is to build up uh, an SBO workflow to develop a uh, CubeSat. So, um, as I mentioned before, we didn't actually have a workflow for CubeSets before uh, in NSPO, uh, pretty much because we don't have the workforce and we are focusing more on uh, main missions. Uh, for CubeSets, we think the uh, domestic university has better opportunities. and uh, but, but nowadays, uh, we think the, um, Using the CubeSats to validate key technology for future mission is pretty important, uh, not just for remote sensing, but uh, we do have our uh, component developments that might require a CubeSat to carry first uh, to validate the, the to, I would say to raise the TRL of those components that we developed so that we could guarantee a more successful future larger mission. So. And, and also, also uh, if we built the merit heritage for the CubeSats, uh, we think it's a good training for project management. So for myself, I, I do learn a lot on managing these projects. And also we're thinking of, uh, we think that uh, the bus development uh, has the possibility to transfer to domestic to domestic universities. So this is our satellite uh, uh, in a glance. Um, so first of all, it's uh, it's a 6U. Uh, we have really large um, SAP uh, solar array panel. And that is because uh, 
for the remote sensing part, we we need the onboard uh, compression capability, and also we need the onboard AI capabilities, and that is causing a lot of power consumption. So we need a huge uh, SAP so that it could support such of a power consumption. Um, we define two sets of bodies axis, and that is because uh, if you know anything about the International Space Station deployment system, uh, usually you will need to mount uh, the satellite according to their mechanical axis. And for our satellite, we have to fold the SAP twice and as a cube and then uh, make the coordinate system align with the International Space Station deployment system. So that's why we have a mechanical body axis that align with that. But on the other hand, for control itself or for the operation of the satellite itself, uh, we will have a fly direction that's defined as, as the X direction, uh, or we sometimes call it the LVLH uh, coordinate system. And that's why uh, we have a mission body axis. That's, is, that, that's a different axis uh, comparing to the mechanical body axis. So that is our satellite at a glance. Um, and so the execution of this project, we have several strategies. Uh, one is that we build up an international partnership. So uh, this is because we want to make sure that the success rate of the bus system uh, is reliable. And also we want to make sure that the schedule of the development of this mission align with our larger uh, for more set mission. Uh, originally, we want the launch to be able, uh, we want the launch to catch the end of 2022 so that it could uh, catch up with a future development of for more set nine. Uh, but now uh, we do have a little bit of delay and uh, we, we don't know when the actual launch date will be, but still that it, if you count, it takes about two years to develop this six U cubes S. And that is actually a faster pace comparing to most of other, uh, most of other groups that built the CubeSats from scratch. So uh, our coordinating team or our collaborator is the ISSL of University of Tokyo. Uh, it's actually led by Professor Nakasuka, uh, and they have uh, they have experience on CubeSats. Uh, I should say they have a lot of experience on CubeSats. They have eleven mission, eleven over eleven success rate of uh, their CubeSats. Uh, they have developed a lot of CubeSats missions, and they have long time partnership with JAXA. Uh, our deployment of this mission is from the International Space Station. Uh, they do have two contractors uh, that would provide the launch uh, opportunity. One is Space BD, the other is NarrowRax. So if we go through the Space BD uh, path, then uh, usually uh, it's reviewed by NASA and JAXA, and um, then we need such kind of partnership with JAXA so that the review process is smooth and fast. So uh, the second part of this uh, execution strategy is that we collaborate with domestic uh, university and domestic partner. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we don't have too much human resources on this project. So we definitely have to contact component manufacturer in Taiwan, um, most of them, uh, when I say component, it's more like a mechanical component manufacturer. Uh, most of the component cannot or does not have the priority to be manufactured in NSPO. So we're trying to partner with uh, a lot of uh, manufacturers in Taiwan. So that's our strategy for the mission. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about the mission trade-off uh, uh, from, from, from the beginning, okay? So the first issue is the launch orbit. Uh, if our audience are um, familiar with remote sensing mission, 
usually for remote sensing, we would choose a sun synchronous orbit because it has better repetitability and also uh, you do have a more stable orbit attitude um, that it does not change the sensing distance too much. Uh, the inclination of the orbit is 90 degree um, and the beta angle, which is the sun shiny angle along the track and also the revisit uh, opportunities are all stable. Uh, the launch vehicle has several options. Um, uh, however, it might be not as easy to secure a launch availability uh, comparing to the ISS deployment. So if you look at the right column of the table, you can see for ISS deployment, uh, the, the benefits of ISS deployment is that it's launch per quarter uh, a year. Uh, I mean, it launched per quarter. So, so that uh, if you have a flexible contract with either of the service provider, then um, they have a better uh, launch flexibility. And also, uh, but but the 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 bad thing about using ISS deployment is that the altitude is changing all the time from 380 to 420. And if you are familiar with remote sensing missions, that means uh, your imaging condition is changing along the tracks. Uh, and for inclination, uh, that is 51.6 degree, uh, uh, which align with the ISS uh, orbit. The problem is that the beta angle and revisited uh, revisit capability are all varying. So for, for analyzing the mission or for analyzing the imaging opportunities is very different from the same sound synchronous orbit. But however, because we want to uh, launch this satellite as soon as possible, we turn out to choose the ISS deployment. And we want to see if we could have uh, if we could build up the and the, uh, the analyzing tools that we could do remote sensing mission on a varying uh, altitude. So uh, first of all, we check the lifetime in the SDK. So uh, I, I, I do know that the, the configuration of the SAP is different from the one that I just saw. Uh, the, the one related to the surface area that's facing forward. So uh, we believe the different configuration is still causing the same around uh, the same the the around the same number as the ballistic co coefficient. So so we have to evaluate uh, how much of a lifetime it could last. So for the worst case, if it's being deployed from 400k. Uh, it would die in about 170 days. Uh, but if we l operate the satellite at a smaller cross uh, area, cross section area, then it will last longer than uh, three years. Yeah, that, that's our uh, estimate. Uh, so that's one uh, trade off that we have to choose. and. Oh, we we characterize the mission to be a low, a pretty short lifetime, uh, so so it's not too much of a problem. Well, we actually think the lifetime is from from three months to six months. The TDI sensor for this mission, uh, TI means time delay integral. Uh, basically, uh, it is a long sorry. Okay. Am I so on? I think. Okay. So, uh, in order to uh, so instead of the push and broom configuration, uh, it's more of the the sensor itself will accumulate the lines in uh, uh well integral lines. So, for example, if we have four stages of the TDI sensor, then it will integrate the four lines all together on board and then output it as a single line output. So which means that um, if we want to operate the TDI sensor correctly, uh, 
such integration should has no mismatch or should has no attitude mis altitude uh, attitude mismatch so which means that uh, we have to trade off between uh, the pointing accuracy or the stability of the satellite's pointing, uh, the trade-off between that to uh, how accurate the, the, the line should be. So, so the graph that you're, you're seeing in the slides is that uh, for if the altitudes, well, sorry, if the attitudes uh, matching capability lost uh, 0.5 percent. Then, for a uh, 30 stages of TDI sensor, you will lose the MTF uh, by about. Uh, I think here is 0.95 percent. So that's about 0.5 percent of degradation on the image quality. So, so if you have less uh, stages to be integral, like if you have 15 stages and uh, your uh, pointing mismatch is 2%, then you will drop to about 0 0.96. Uh, that's 4% of the degradation of the total, the, the final images. So that's the trade off that we have to study. Uh, so this will restrict us about how we could design the line rate so that it could match with the ground speed yeah that's the second issue that we are trading off so those two are the main trade-offs that we faced for a remote sensing cube set um, uh, because for cube sets comparing to a larger mission cube sets has a uh, lower cost uh, lower uh, uh, so we have to keep the cost low, which means that uh, we might not be able to choose the orbit that we want to launch. And we have to match the payload or we want to make sure the payload match with the bus pointing capability so that it could still be a successful uh, remote sensing setup. Yeah, so that's the main two trade-offs. And from now on, I will talk about a little bit of the uh, development process, both on the bus system and also on the payload. For the bus, as I mentioned before, we're working with the ISSL, which is from University of Tokyo. And they have a lot of experience on CubeSats. Uh, uh, if you know Echolus or uh, Rwanda sets, and those are all from their labs. So. At this stage, we're building the structural model for, for the satellite. And you can see uh, there's a 6U cube on the left. And the uh, solar array panel is extended twice as the body. Uh, but at this point, we figure there is one issue uh, that if we use the long type uh, solar array panel, the uh, structural test will result in the 2 hertz of vibration. This two hertz of vibration is way below the, the well, this is a very low value um, and it will cause the pointing capability of the whole satellite to blur. So they are suggesting that we change the uh, solar ray panel pattern to this double door type that it will raise the vibration uh, frequency to 17 hertz. So this is one trade-off that we made for, for the whole structure. Uh, the second thing is that we, we have to discuss a lot about the power consumption uh, of the satellite. Uh, as I mentioned, we have mission AI and we have mission imaging. For the imaging part, we are um, using the telescope to capture the image and we need to perform online compression. And compression costs calculation calculations cost power so this mission imaging together with the uh, compression is causing a lot of power uh it would actually spike up for the total power to be around 40 40 watts and this is mission plus the bus system okay and another 
uh, function is AI, uh, the, the, the AI recognition uh, part. That function is also causing a lot of power uh, that would add up the total power consumption to 42 watts. And the third part is actually not uh, the emissions or, or not the problem of the payload, but the problem of the bus is for data transfer. Uh, we have S-band antenna, S-band transceiver on the bus. And also we have a, uh, we have a X-band transmitter on board the bus system. The X-band transmitter is uh, causing even more power than the, the payload itself. So, so these all has to be evaluated pretty carefully and that's the result of our super huge uh, solar array panel. Yeah. And we discussed a little bit with the, uh, we discussed the operation feasibility analysis with the ISSL. Uh, if, this is the scenario for a whole day that um, there are several orbits that we think, uh, because of its ISS orbit, not a sound synchronous orbit. So it doesn't have a good uh, repeatability, which means the the 14, oh, the 15 up to 16 orbits per day will be very different uh, from each other. Uh, so so uh, especially given that we have so much power to be consumed, uh, Within one day, there might be only one or two orbits that has the power capability to start a mission orbit, to, to start a mission. And also within the 16 orbits, there, there might be only one orbit that's suitable for downloading the mission data. Well, as I mentioned, uh, the, there's S-band and X-band. For the S-band, um, uh, we do have context, uh, better context for S-band antenna. Uh, I think we, we analyze it and about four to five uh, adjunct uh, orbits have, will have the capability to download the data, but that, that is for command and telemetry. For mission data itself, it will require the X-band antenna and uh, because of power consumption and because of the uh, ground contact uh, uh, duty cycle, uh, there might be only one orbit that could that we could use within one day to download the mission data. So this is, these are the analysis that we collaborate with uh, with the bus side or with University of Tokyo side. And we do have our other development progress on the payload. Uh, I could talk a little bit more about the payload. Uh, for the bus side, it, we pretty much rely on what uh, University of Tokyo is capable of doing. So so. It, yeah, and if, uh, we, we do pay more attention on, on the payload. So for the payload, um, we, 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 the, the mission is that we, we want to accomplish uh, three uh, main key technology. Uh, one is the course type sense, uh, course type telescope. So a course type telescope is what we draw at here. Uh, when you have parallel light comes into the mirror, the mirror will reflect it to a second mirror and reflect it to the third mirror and then fold uh, it to uh, finally focus on one line, uh, one line sensor at this point. Uh, as you can see, uh, the light is not, um, the mirror is not put in a parallel sense. And this would cause, uh, this has a benefit of lengthening the focus length, uh, but the defects is that it's even more difficult to align the mirror comparing to FORMOSAT 8 or FORMOSAT 5. Yeah, so, so uh, that's why we said for this mission, we, we are validating the manufacturing of these uh, type of mirrors, these type of telescope. We want to make sure that uh, uh, we want to make sure that our manufacturing contractor has the capability to build uh, these kind of off-axis uh, telescope. 
So this is uh, one idea of the telescope. And after the light route has been developed or has been built, we have to analyze a structure, a telescope's optical structure that, uh, that has a good uh, mode analysis. So we want the first mode to be as large as possible. So, so we developed the, the structure to support such mirrors. Uh, we have, you know, mirror one, mirror two, folded mirror, and this is mirror three. So we 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 want to uh, uh, we have to develop a structure to support these mirrors. So these are, this is the the structure that we develop, and as you can see, we perform model model analysis, and it passes the criteria that we set up. The third thing for the telescope itself is thermal related issue. Uh, as you can see, for the satellite itself, uh, only half or three U of the envelope is designed for for our payload. So this is the telescope, and this is the, uh, the electrical unit that we help uh, that we build to support uh, the telescope. And as you can see, that we have to build the thermal model. Uh, for the telescope itself, because you can see that the the support of the mirror is pretty thin, and also uh, if the sensor is in operation, then there will be heat uh, dissipation from the sensor itself, and we want to make sure the heat could successfully dissipate to the heat path that we design. And also, you can see because of the thin support of the mirror, um, we do. We do want to make sure that the temperature difference is not causing too much problem on the on the structure of the telescope, and and so we built the thermal model to analyze the uh, the temperature difference on each of the part uh, on, on each part that we care. Yeah. So these are the structural part. Uh, the second thing is mode uh, mode transition of our payload. So. Uh, we have several modes. Uh, there's power on, there's downlink, there's heat up, there is AI mode. So basically, uh, these are several functions that we design for for this telescope. Um, the first mode is to uh, it's just storage, which which actually only the bus will be turned on and the pedal will be in off mode. And then whenever uh, the mission is ready. Uh, whenever the orbit condition is ready, then it will turn on to a standby mode, and then it will heat up the uh, telescope a little bit because uh, we want to make sure the imaging configuration is the same as what we expected. So there is a heating up for the telescope, and then um, within the heat up mode, there is image mode, there is image without compression mode, and there is image with, well, well there, there's several modes, I would say. So that is the imaging part. And on the left is the AI recognition. So as I mentioned, uh, the image that we take, we will perform an online AI recognition on board. So, so there is another mode that it would turn on, but oh, sorry, there is another mode that would turn on the AI capability that is different from the imaging. And there is third one that is uh, for downlink, as I mentioned, uh, the X-band transmitter is very power, very power consuming. So we separate it to several modes so that there will be no circumstances that all of the uh, power consuming items are on. Yeah, that's the strategy. So, and, to work with the bus system, uh, we have to develop the uh, the interface control uh, document. So, so for payload on the right hand side, there there's three boards uh, that that would come that that that's within our uh, telesc uh, that's within our payload. The most of the communication are built on the IPM. Well, actually, I don't know what IPM stands for, but but. Basically, it handles the power uh, coming from the EPS of the bus system. It handles the uh, command and telemetry through UART from the OBC. And also, it handles the mission data, uh, which will go through an SBI protocol 
uh, from the FPGA on IPM board to the FPGA on the uh, X band transmitter. And it has to uh, have a bit rate of larger or equal to 20 megabit per second. Yeah, that, that's the interface control. And, and also, uh, I forgot to mention about uh, the heater and the thermistor. Uh, because the thermal control is also powered from the EPS, and uh, the on and off commands is generated from the OVC part. So that analysis is, is should also be included in the bus uh, thermal analysis. That that's the uh, this is some uh, some data flow that we go within uh, our uh, payloads EU. So uh, there is focal plane array. There is IPM, uh, which is the main uh, port uh, connected to to the bus. And there is the AI board. So basically, there's three parts, or or uh, there's three PCB. The first PCB is directly connected to the CMOS sensor. It will process the sensor's data and send out a. Uh, I think here, we write it to be parallel, but I think now it is serial. Uh, I will double. I will double check this part. So so it will pass the raw image into the compression core. Uh, so this is the compression core. We have a JPEG 2000 IP uh, that will perform the compression and store the data if necessary, uh, because usually the uh, the imaging orbit will be different from the data downloading orbit. So it definitely has to have a non-volatile memory that could be stored even without power, uh, that, that could store the mission data even without power and then be powered on again when mission uh, transfer or mission download orbit is ready. So, so there is a non-volatile memory within, uh, within the main board. And the third part is the AI. <clears throat> AI would require uh, also a different uh, orbit because it's also very time consuming. So, uh, no, I mean, power consuming. So, so the AI board will uh, will will get the data from the non-volatile memory once we turn on the AI board, and it will perform uh, some some AI recognition and store the result back to the non-volatile memory. So, so that uh, for future orbits, we'll be able to download the result of the re AI recognition. Yeah, that's the the relation between all of these three boards. Yeah, and for the compression, uh, we do have a development board uh, on the ground so that we could test the real capability of the, the compression hardware. Uh, when, I say comp when I say compression hardware, it's the FVGA that, uh, that we put a compression IP into the FVGA and the hardware will perform the compression uh, using the FVGA. And as you can see, uh, if we compare a pure software compression with the pure uh, hardware, when hardware is the FPGA compression, you can see there is different performance on, on different level of compression ratio. Uh, SSIM is the is like how good the degradation is. So a larger number is better. If a pure software compression, you could reach up to a, a, a better performance comparing to the hardware. But still, that uh, there's no significant difference. At least, it's not a, a degree of order. Uh, the, the, uh, it's not an order of degree difference. And for root mean sum square, uh, oh, sorry, root mean sum error, uh, it also has a comparable uh, performance between the pure software and the hardware. Uh, and also for the compression ratio itself, as the setup compression ratio to be larger, uh, it has a uh, more aligned performance uh, between the hardware and the software uh, compression. So these are the uh, compression performance that we uh, we analyze on ground, and that is for the compression part. And last is the AI uh, recognition part. For the AI recognition, we actually look for boats, uh, um, or I should say ships. Yeah, we. Uh, the capability it, is that we want to look for ships uh, within the image that we take. 
and we want to output the coordinate of this these uh, recognized sheep uh, in between this picture. So the data size is uh, is um, designed to be the same data size as the uh, what the main payload or what what our image uh, what our main image is, and then we perform a AI recognition on this snapshot of the image, and then the the network would output the coordinates of the ships. So uh, that's why you can see that uh, for for each frame of the image, it would output at least 20 sets of the ships that you could recognize. Uh, power dissipation is, peak power is less than 50 watts, but actually I think we reach 7 or 18 watts at this moment. Yeah, and it's also using an FPGA uh, IC to perform the recognition. So that's pretty much uh, what we have for the payload. Uh, so a quick conclusion is that the concept of this mission, uh, uh, I presented the concept of the mission to everybody and um, I talked about the mission requirement, the architecture, the flow down of the mission requirement to the system requirement, and uh, talk about the current development progress of the mission. So I would like to use this opportunity to thank to my colleague. Uh, I myself is Chen Yu. Uh, we have Dr. Noya Huang and her little two kids, uh, Dr. Jero Shang. Uh, she is mainly focusing on the AI recognition part and our uh, long supporter, Dr. Albert Lin, uh, I believe he also helped to sponsor uh, other three uh, CubeSat missions that uh, Professor Lauren, uh, Professor Zhang is working on that. So, so uh, this is the team that we are uh, for, for this whole 6U CubeSat mission. Uh, and hopefully that we have a successful launch in our planned schedule. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tsan. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll open it up to questions now. If you have any questions, please feel free to either raise your hand uh, by clicking on the button on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Or if you prefer, uh, please feel free to type your question in the chat. So um, one thing I noticed is, of course, uh, due to the uh, remote sensing data that you'll be using, I expect you have a very large data volume, which necessitates yes. the use of X-Band. Yes. Um, so are you handling all your communications over X-Band, or uh, will you also be using other frequencies for command uplink and or beacon? For the command uplink and telemetry download, we're using S-Band. Um, and and uh, they uh, for University of Tokyo, they have very good heritage on that part. So <laughs> I, I should say I will put all the responsibility on them. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, although, uh, of course, S-Band requires a fairly high uh, level of, uh, of, of uh, attitude control and uh, determination in order to use because of the narrower beam width. So mm -hmm. um, have you, how will you guys be? Uh, be ensuring that you are able to uh, that your ADCS is able to uh, handle this even in the uh, worst contingencies. Mm -hmm. The the ADCS sub module is actually uh, 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 it's self made by uh, their lab, and um, uh, for the satellite itself, we have two sets of S band antenna, and they are uh, opposite to each other, so that it has a better coverage on uh, both of the directions. Um, so to my knowledge, I think uh, they they actually use this um, two direction redundancy to cover most of the directions. That that's my understanding. Okay. Yeah. So 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 I I don't know how much of the beam uh, bandwidth will be, but but I, that's what I was told that it has a better coverage. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so will uh, will command and control be uh, performed uh, here from Taiwan or out of Japan or both? Uh, the idea of this collaboration is that we want to use their operation software both in uh, Japan and in Taiwan. So, uh, and we are still uh, following this 
philosophy on the, on the development. So, so now we are at the stage of communicating. Uh, uh, we're at the stage of, um, I should say, converging uh, how they will operate the satellite and how we expect us to operate the satellite uh, at this stage. Uh, but to be honest, we have not finalized the operation software at this moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so just out of curiosity, are you using uh, amateur radio frequencies or are you using uh, commercial bands? Uh, I think it's commercial band. They, okay. they will apply for uh, for the frequency band on ITU. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, that sounds good. Um, so I, I assume this will uh, sort of bypass the problems that we encountered where we're, Taiwan is not a member of the ITU and therefore uh, we had a lot of difficulty uh, applying for uh, frequency coordination. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have a question from Sam Huang of NCKU and yes. he's asking um, whether there is any overheating situation with the chip and how do you solve it, passive heat sink or active heat pipe? Mm -hmm. uh we are building passive heat sinks for most of our components. Uh, as you could imagine, uh, there's sensor and there's also three, um, oh, except for the sensor itself, we have three boards uh, that each have uh, FPGA chips on it. Uh, for two of those FPGA chips is consuming about 10 to 15 watts um, on the calculation. So we, we, we use passive heat sink for each of the boards and we uh, conduct the, the heat to the, the box of that, that's encapsulating the three boards and the box has other, uh, the box has a heat uh, thermal straps that's tied up to the bus. So the bus would dissipate the power. Yeah, that, that, that's the philosophy. Uh, we, do not have an active heat pipe. So, so the, the, the problem for heat accumulation is more on the electrical board rather than on the sensor. The sensor itself, uh, because the design philosophy for the sensor is for a larger mission. So actually uh, the sensor, for, for the sensor to fit our 6U size, it actually lowered the operation uh, clock frequency of the sensor. So it's actually dissipating less power than we expected from, for, for the sensor itself. But, but the electrical world is, cause, is uh, dissipating a lot of power. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. And um, uh, so I noticed you're using a CMOS sensor for the remote sensing instrument. And mm -hmm. uh, one lesson learned from Ideasat, and usually lesson mm -hmm. learned implies under not very happy conditions is, uh, <laughs> We did experience a critical anomaly where our spacecraft powered down for one and a half months. And we uh -huh. believe that one possible reason for this is we identified a single point failure on our EPS where we had uh, a CMOS uh, logic gate as well as solid state relays, which also use CMOS components. And CMOSs, when subject to energetic particle bombardment, are subject to uh, latch up where they essentially short out. And unless mm -hmm. they can be power cycled, um, there is no way of. Uh, of uh, of clearing the uh, situation, I uh, see, I can, see. can you share with us um, the uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, factors or risks you're considering in terms of the radiation environment when it comes to the remote sensing uh, payload? Okay, uh, mm, that's that's a rather long question. Let me try to. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let me try to think. Of it. So so for for the payload itself, I, I should say uh, we are. Um, because you're saying this, uh, the situation that you 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 faced is more on the EPS system, right? Uh, the the CMOS uh, failure is uh, causing the EPS system to work uh, inappropriately. Um, so 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 for our part, uh, the EPS system is developed from the bus side. So we're pretty much relying on their flight heritage so that it could always power. The payload uh, successfully, and so so that uh, power problem uh, is not something that we uh, that we are worried. But for the payload itself, um, the okay, the CMOS sensor is actually uh, we we don't know whether it's 
Red Heart or not, <laughs> because this is uh, the very first kind of the sensor that we manufacture and we design in, 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 in for, for this mission. So, so up to this point, we have not performed environmental tests on, on the sensor, uh, not even. Uh, so in the near future, uh, we will perform the uh, What's that called? CS test, uh, which that we would inject different power noises to to the sensor and to see if the sensor could endure uh, the different power sources, and and the next part is uh, thermal vacuum. Oh, sorry, thermal cycle, and then the next part is thermal vacuum. So those are the the performance uh, the the test that we'll perform on the sensor. Uh, but as as for the radiation parts, uh, to be honest, we we didn't plan to uh, test the, uh, the 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 capability whether the sensor could endure the radiation or not. Okay. Yeah. I, I would say one lesson learned is um, for us is basically if it's a C I assume you probably impl implemented this, but if it's a CMOS sensor, uh, I imagine it's usually powered down unless you're using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's, That's a good uh, protection mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. our mistake yeah, yeah. was so, so our philosophy is that we will actually power down the payload most mm -hmm. of the time <laughs> so, yeah so so so, okay. so hopefully that, that, that reduces the risk a lot problem. yeah yeah hopefully it doesn't have too much problem okay yeah. so, okay we have a question from uh will in the netherlands representative office in taipei um hmm. as you said it's a verifying mission can you also share some vision about cubesats in nspo in the future uh Okay, that's a Reddit big questions. So, so I'm not in the position to comment on uh, what the future NSBO would decide on the CubeSat mission because uh, I myself think I'm just the project manager of this particular mission. But I imagine that uh, the the uh, the creation of this mission is to verify some future mission, right? So, so we think that. Oh, well, I personally think that there will be some other CubeSat mission that we built to verify future missions. Not not just because uh, as the satellite buildings are uh, getting more expensive and as we are, are relying more on our future, uh, like for most of the FormalSat series, we, we, we probably have never failed and we should never fail for future mission. So, so, so this philosophy of using CubeSat to verify a uh, key technology is probably a roadmap uh, that we'll build in in SBO that uh, we will help either domestic partner or international partner to verify more uh, components or uh, key technology for a future mission. Yeah. Is the implication then that NSPO can accept a higher level of risk with CubeSats? That's what I'm trying to convince to most of our supervisors, that if you want to build a CubeSat mission, if you think CubeSat mission is cheaper than larger mission, then you have to accept the risk that CubeSat could fail. So, so <laughs> I think this is, a mutual, uh, this is a mutual work between you and me that we also have to uh, convince, you have to, I, I think you have to convince most and probably mm -hmm. Ministry of Education that CubeSats are for educational purpose. CubeSats are risky. CubeSats can fail. And this is also what I'm trying to convince to our supervisor that CubeSats are cheap, but they should be able to fail. So, so that that um, people will take more risk, but people would be more creative on CubeSat missions. I recall the NASA administrator in the 1990s, Daniel Golden, had uh, a saying, faster, better, cheaper. And then I think uh, what a lot of critics said was, uh, pick two. Um, <laughs> I, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I do agree with your standpoint over there. And basically, if we are pushing something we've never done before, then a higher level of risk should be tolerated. Not unacceptably so, but we have to be prepared <laughs> that um, this might, uh, that again, certain things can happen that were not, uh, never planned for or unexpected. And the most important thing is that we figure out the lessons learned, we figure out mitigation methods, and we share that. Mm -hmm. I'll be happy to send you a long list of, uh, of uh, lessons learned from uh, ideas. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. we have a question from Warren Zhu. Uh, 
Any advice for students who are currently in school and are interested in a career in the space industry? Oh, okay. That's that, that, okay. That that's a difficult question. I would say. So for NSBO, we are not part of the industry. So, so as uh, although that we do accept intern students from from various new universities, and also sometimes we have job openings for for uh, for graduates, but uh, we we don't have the commitment capability to accept all uh, students that's graduating from this focus. So, uh, but but anyhow, uh, I believe NSBO are trying to promote the space industry nowadays. Uh, as long as there is more uh, job opportunities, I, I think, if there's more job opportunities, there are more students or newer graduates that would uh, come back to focus on uh, this area of work. So, so um, my answer would be if there is more. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry, I think the internet just cut out there for a moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think I can add on to that. Basically, there are actually a lot more opportunities now in terms of interest in the space industry from the industry sector in Taiwan. Over mm -hmm. the past couple couple of months, we've received a lot of contact from local electronics and communications manufacturers who are interested in jumping into the uh, the LEO communication satellite market. Mm -hmm. And in the case of some of them, which are OEMs, they say that they have the ability to build the designs that, for example, uh, overseas uh, customers send them, although they mm -hmm. really have no idea what m motivated the designs, where, where the specifications and requirements came from. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, if you're interested in uh, perhaps working in the space industry, or at least components or subsystem providers, one very good uh, thing you could do is to, through our educational sector, um, basically get involved in a university uh, small satellite project and understand the design process, the methodology, and that puts you in a much better situation to understand where these requirements came from, what motivated these designs, and uh, again, will uh, prepare you for uh, being able to provide much more valuable insight into uh, some of the requirements that you'll see uh, potentially in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I do want to echo what Lauren just said. Uh, for NSBO, uh, although we are trying to uh, leverage a little bit of our time to train students, um, but we are at, we're not at the position of um, being very creative to students or being cre very creative to what the student is learning. So so our job uh, roles is more uh, is still tightly tied to uh, to missions, uh, the, the national missions. So so if students are are interested in this area, they should definitely learn more in, in universities. Yeah. And and um, we do have some intern openings, but not as much. But I, I do believe the universities has um, better uh, flexibility on, on training the students. From, uh, let's see, Christian, can you explain more on how the development of your CubeSat bus was assigned to uh, University of Tokyo? Curious that for building up capacity in Taiwan, you delegate away this hands-on part. What practical reasons were there that encouraged this besides just wanting to use Nakasuka-san's ground control software? Not entirely skeptical. There can be good reasons. Just curious about which ones led you to do that. Okay, so, so the, the answer is that uh, because of the mission, um, uh, the 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 philosophy of this CubeSat mission is that uh, they still want it to be very successful. <laughs> so, so 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 which means that they they think that we should try to find a research group that has a very good experience on operating uh, CubeSats so that we have a better confidence on, uh, on being a successful CubeSat mission. That, that's the short answer. So, so that's why we look for uh, a more experienced team uh, around the globe, and we have the, uh, the opportunities to, to work with University of Tokyo. Okay, and again, I just want to echo, uh, I think what I mentioned before at the beginning, I mean, I can also understand that um, uh, of course, uh, NSPO may be more risk averse than uh, those of us in academia. 
But at the same time, of course, for certain mission crit for certain time critical missions, it you may not necessarily have the time and the ability to develop a stable spacecraft platform. And in that case, it does make sense to um, to buy a uh, essentially a commercial off the shelf uh, system that's been flight proven before. Again, mm -hmm. different needs, and I think both are very worthwhile, both in terms of developing our own capacity to build spacecraft, and at the same time, understanding that there are certain time critical missions where that you may not have enough time to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no more questions, thank you very much, Dr. John, for sharing your experiences with us. Yeah, with thank you for the invitation. And in the upcoming mission. And again, uh, always very happy to share lessons learned. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming. Okay, Bye. oh wait, we have one more, sorry, question. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, can, I, can I have the Dr. John's, Dr. John's, uh, Contact information, sorry. Contact information, yeah. yeah I yeah. believe, uh, let me type my email. In the, sure, thank you. So this is my email. Uh, feel free to contact me. Although I don't really know who that is. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm uh, Will from the Netherlands and Taipei office. Thank you very oh, much. Okay. For, thank you for your sharing. It's very great. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then um, I believe that concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for participating. Thank you very much, Dr. Sun. And again, um, uh, we wish you a successful flight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.